Thank you, Brother Ricky. That was really edifying. Brother Michael's sermon text will be in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Our dear, gracious Heavenly Father, I want to pray for Brother Michael tonight, that you'll give him strength to speak, Lord, and that um, his sermon will be ever, very edifying, Lord, and that everyone will have ears to hear tonight, Lord. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. I believe that was Brother Enoch's first time doing that. Good job, brother. Thank you. <clears throat> well, as with every renewal we've had, um, you know, we, we come prepared with some thoughts and uh, some meditations to share with one another, and then as we're here, it continues to grow and grow, and you realize that, that what you saw on your own studying at home is, is just a little tiny piece of the big picture. And so what I uh, want to share with you this evening, I, I have that uh, in mind. I, I know that what I have to say is not going to be comprehensive on this subject. This is just a little part of what God is doing. But that doesn't mean that, that what I'm going to say isn't true or has no value to it. <clears throat> there, are, there are two kinds of messages when it comes to sanctification. One has to do with uh, what we must do. And I'm not, I'm not downplaying this. I'm not going to say this is bad or wrong. God forbid. Uh, we, we must sanctify ourselves and we must sanctify God to ourselves. So, and this is, this is commanded in Scripture. It's spoken of and we're exhorted to do it. Uh, but my message is about the sanctification that Christ has done. No less true, but it's different. In Hebrews chapter 13, I want to begin at verse 9. Paul says to the Hebrews, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Your heart does need to be established, and it should be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. There's nothing left to eat of that. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Now, you know the central consideration in Hebrews is Jesus Christ, our great high priest. If there are any, either Jew or Gentile, who are reluctant to give up animal sacrifices and Jewish feast days and new moons and Sabbaths, those things that were commanded in the law of Moses, the Apostle Paul presents the case for looking unto Jesus, the great high priest and the offering for sin made once for all. And in this matter of establishing the heart, it must be established, Paul says, not with meats. <clears throat> if the heart's going to be established, it must be established on the basis of the removal of our sins, not on diet dietary laws or other such ordinances. Under the old covenant, which was, of course, only a shadow of the true things that were to come, the bodies of the beast whose blood was brought into the sanctuary by the high priest were burned outside the camp, but now Jesus has suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. This is how our hearts are established, and this is the altar from which we eat. Now concerning this eating, just briefly, no one you know, could eat of the sin offerings there were many different kinds of offerings, but the, the sin offerings, and actually particular sin offerings, those sin offerings from which the blood was brought into the sanctuary or brought into the holy place, those sin offerings were not to be eaten of. You know, some of the, like the peace offerings and those, the priests could, to, uh, could get their flesh hook and, and dip it down and get a chunk of the meat, and that was theirs. They could eat portions of it. And, but not this one, not the one that the blood was brought into the sanctuary. Nobody 
ate of this sacrifice. <clears throat> the saints have a right to eat of the altar of Jesus Christ. If a person's living, if a person is serving God by laws, rituals, ordinances, he has no right. This now this is this is something that the Holy Spirit said. This isn't like he he ought not to. He has no right and he can't eat at the gospel table. He cannot take any portion of this sacrifice and use it to sustain himself. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. That's a strong statement. But those who believe in Jesus Christ have our hearts established with grace, and we have an altar that we eat from continually. Now the object or the objective here in this text is of course to sanctify the people. Jesus suffered in order to sanctify the people. And briefly, what does it mean to be sanctified? Most believers understand, at least on an elementary level, what this is, that we're set apart from others, untainted by sin in the world, preserved and perhaps even protected. A simple way to say it might be that we are special we're not like everyone else, but that is not the end of sanctification. Sanctification has a purpose behind it, and that purpose is to be prepared for God's use. If God is not going to use it, then there's no point in it being sanctified. But if God is going to use a thing or a person, then it must be sanctified. God will not share what belongs to him with competitors. So then our definition of sanctification is narrowed down to being set apart for God, preserved for his use, protected by him and for him. So being sanctified in this text does not mean that we have been granted a state of sinless perfection. I like what Brother Ricky just said. It does mean that we don't have to sin. Amen. Although it is impossible for the new creation to sin, in Hebrews 13, 12, we're speaking of the sanctification that Jesus did for us, not that we do ourselves. And as always, Scripture provides the best examples. <clears throat> the Levitical priesthood was sanctified unto the Lord. In Exodus 29, the Lord gave the instructions to Moses on how to sanctify the priests, and it was carried out in uh, Leviticus chapter 8. Aaron and his sons were to wash themselves, then put on the priestly garments, the coat, the robe, the ephod, the girdle, the breastplate, the mitre, and the holy crown upon their heads. Then they were to be anointed with holy oil. A bullock was offered as a sin offering. A ram was offered as a burnt offering to the Lord. Another ram was slain and the blood put on the tip of the right ear, the right thumb, and the great toe of the right foot of Aaron and his sons. And the blood was sprinkled around the altar. Then the blood was taken from the altar and sprinkled on Aaron's and his son's garments to consecrate them to the Lord. Now this procedure was only done one time. This is at the beginning of their ministry. This was done and it wasn't, wasn't done to that priest again. This sanctified him for service. <clears throat> we know this is true because God provided the instructions for the priest, uh, pardon me, <clears throat> It did not mean that Aaron and his sons would never sin again. We know because God also provided instructions for the priests to make offerings for their own sins. <clears throat> and we could, we could remember Nadab and Abihu in this matter. There went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord, even though they were sanctified. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm differentiating here between what Christ does and what we do. The washing, the garments, the anointing with oil, and the blood applied, sanctified them to minister to God. That made them accepted by God. They could make offerings for themselves and the people. They could partake of the offerings of the people. They could burn the incense. They could anoint with the holy oil. They could, when it was their, when it was their turn, they could even stand before the mercy seat in the holiest of holies on the Day of Atonement. This sanctification qualified them and them alone for service to God as long as they served God in the manner that he prescribed. <clears throat> this sanctifying procedure guaranteed that God would receive them and bless the people on account of their service. 
This made them officially recognized by God. <clears throat> the sanctification that is in Jesus' blood is the sanctification that Christ has done, not that we have done nor could we ever do. And Jesus did this primarily for God. His suffering without the gate guarantees that every one of God's heirs are sanctified, separate from those who are not the heirs. They're prepared to be his temple, prepared to be the bride of Christ, prepared to inherit all things to the glory of God. His suffering was a transaction strictly between the Son and the Father, but the effect of it is that we are sanctified. Just like the Day of Atonement, under the law, the high priest did nearly everything. The only thing he didn't do was take the scapegoat out, and he didn't, he didn't take the, the body out to be burned. <clears throat> but even those things were fulfilled in Christ. But on the Day of Atonement, the high priest cast lots over the two goats. The high priest sacrificed the animals. The high priest took the live coals from the altar, and he took the incense. The high priest sprinkled the blood. He made the atonement. He confessed the sins of the people on the living goat. He changed his garments. He washed. He made the burnt offering. The priest did all this necessary work, but atonement was made for all Israel, and God dwelt among them because of what this one priest did. He did all the work, and the people benefited from it. Why was it necessary for Jesus to sanctify the people like this? Now, why, why isn't... Our effort, our uh, sanctification that we perform, why isn't that good enough? <clears throat> One reason, which has already been preached, is that if Jesus didn't sanctify himself and sanctify us, then we couldn't be sanctified in any way. Before God could receive the sacrifices and the service to him in the tabernacle under the old covenant, nearly everything had to be sanctified with blood. The priest the altar, the mercy seat, and all the vessels. It wasn't that the blood did something to the objects like something magical, or was some kind of a magical potion or something, but the blood made those objects accepted and sanctified for God's use. If there was a payment made by a sacrifice of an innocent life, the sanctifying blood would allow God to make use of something from the cursed realm. In this sense, Sanctification bridges the vast chasm between God and man, and it was done by blood. That's very important. Amen. This could not be done by the works of men. It had to be paid for with innocent blood. Whereupon neither the First Testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water, and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission, no payment. This is the role of the blood then. However, the main point in the text is that Jesus suffered without the gate so that he might sanctify the people with his blood. In order for the blood to be accepted as the effective purging and sanctifying agent, the body which shed the blood had to be burned outside the camp of the people, which means the body is the sin bearer. And it was effectively cursed. That's why you couldn't eat of it. The blood was to be the proof and the testimony that innocent life was completely consumed in payment for sin. Now also I want to draw your attention to these two words, the people. Jesus did this to sanctify the people. Scripture is very clear that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. The sin of every man that has ever lived and that ever will live in this world has been paid for in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that is crystal clear. Amen. However, not everyone has been sanctified by his blood. Amen. Only the people are sanctified with his blood. What Jesus accomplished in his death was very precise and particular. It made the way for God to have those whom he had chosen 
before the foundation of the world. Although propitiation is sufficiently potent to make atonement for the whole race, it was only the people that are sanctified for God. So the primary thrust of this sanctification is for a way to be made for God to do and to get what he purposed to do. Speaking hypothetically, and I know this is dangerous, bear with me. Speaking hypothetically, before the foundation of the world, God could purpose to do marvelous works in men and choose those whom he would receive and have all manner of glorious intentions with a very specific outcome that would reveal his manifold wisdom and mercy and love and grace. But if Jesus did not come and sanctify the people, and indeed the whole work, then all that God had purposed before the foundation of the world would be nothing more than wishes. Of course, I, this is hypothetical and this is impossible because Jesus is the Christ, so this, that's not even possible. But I say that to, to, to increase our understanding of the importance and centrality of Jesus Christ in this matter of the purpose of the Father being fulfilled all hinges on Jesus Christ's blood, of him sanctifying the people for God. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling unto himself the world, not imputing their trespasses unto them, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, and from Ephesians 1, according as he hath chosen us in him, that's in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. This is all about God getting what he's purposed. Before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, his children, according to the good pleasure of his will. This is about how God sees you, sanctification. Either he sees you as one of Adam's sinful offspring, offspring or one of Christ's seed. One is condemned, the other is being saved. One is cursed, the other is blessed. One race is not his people, the other race is his people. God is not the God of one, but he is God of the other. One is born dead, the other is born again. One man is weak and powerless, a captive of the devil, tossed to and fro on the sea of life. The other is sanctified unto God. If you've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, God is able to conform you to the image of his Son. Amen. Jesus can send his Holy Spirit into your hearts. You will be a member of the body of Christ and an heir with Christ. God can and will do everything necessary to prepare you to reign with Christ forever and ever. That's the sanctification I'm talking about. Christ Jesus sanctified the people for God so that God his Father could do all that he purposed to do. But again, just as a precaution, I want to state that I'm, I'm not saying that means we're just bystanders in this. We had no part in the sanctifying transaction that took place in the death resurrection and ascension of Christ, yet we have received all the marvelous, gracious benefits of being the sanctified ones. The people of God are sanctified. We are participants with Christ in the work of sanctification. There is a sanctifying work that we are commanded to do, that we have been given grace to do, and that we must do. Jesus left some sufferings behind for us to fill up, and sanctification cannot be separated from suffering. Just you think that out and see if, see if that's true. Amen. Suffering in this world, that is. But the only reason we can do it is because Christ has first sanctified us to God in his blood. And his life guarantees the work. That is his living right now. I've heard it said that sanctification takes time. And this is true took about three days. The sanctification of which Hebrews 13, 12 is speaking was sealed. It was made permanent by Jesus. We do not atone for our sins with works, 
We do not punish ourselves in payment for our sins. We do not perform penance. We do confess our sins, and we put off our sinning by the grace of God. But the payment has been made. Jesus has sanctified us with his blood, and God is satisfied. Now, the same truth is stated in a different way in Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm going to read verses 10, 12, and 14. By the which will, that's God's will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But this man, after he hath offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That sounds to me like it's a done deal. All of this is the result of the sanctification accomplished in Christ's blood. We are perfected forever in this sense. Also stated in Hebrews 10, I want to draw some other things out of this chapter. His laws have been put in our hearts and minds. Our sins are remembered no more. We have boldness to enter into the holiest. We have a new and living way consecrated for us. Not only are you sanctified, a way for you has been sanctified. Our consciences have been sprinkled. We have true hearts in the full assurance of faith. Our bodies have been washed. Thus we are strongly exhorted to draw near to God and enter the most holy place ourselves. And we don't have to wait for any of those things. See, you have that because you've been sanctified by the blood of Christ. Would God give that to you? Would God make that accessible to you if you were not sanctified? How did all these marvelous benefits come to us? Jesus sanctified us in his blood. <clears throat> now, the, the means of our sanctification from our text in Hebrews 13, 12, the means is that he suffered without the gate. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. As I said, in the law of Moses, <clears throat> the body of a sin offering was to be burned outside the camp. And uh, this was to hallow the priest. The, in Leviticus chapter 8 and Leviticus chapter 4, this was also for sins of ignorance. In Leviticus chapter 16, on the Day of Atonement, this was done. And I want to point out another thing here to you. Hebrews 10.10 10 says we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, 12 says we were sanctified with his blood. Now, these don't contradict one another. Both are required for the sanctification of the people. The blood came from the body. The body of the sacrifice was the bearer of the sin and had to be sacrificed, then burned outside the camp so that sin was separated from the people and the blood of that same animal had to be presented before God. So both are true. The suffering sacrifice is what gave the blood its sanctifying power. Without both the suffering sacrifice and the blood, there's no sanctification. The blood does not avail if there's no suffering for sin. All our sin was born in the body of Jesus on the cross. But having sins taken away would be to no benefit if Jesus did not raise from the dead and enter into the presence of God with his own blood, the eternal testimony of his suffering for sin. The death of Jesus in these things is not just a mere coincidence with the sacrifices under the old covenant. God actually designed those sacrifices with his Christ in mind. That's why they coincide. <clears throat> The sin offering was burned outside the gate because Jesus was going to suffer without the gate. The blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat and the altar because Jesus was going to enter into the holy place with his own blood and obtain eternal redemption for us. Jesus' suffering without the gate indicates that sanctification was purchased at tremendous cost, personal cost to him. When an offering for sin was made, under the Old Covenant, the portions of the bullock, including the fat, were removed and burned on the altar. Most people remember that the blood 
was forbidden under the, the law, it was forbidden to eat or drink the blood. Well, the fat was forbidden too. That, this was a, a testimony forever for Israel that they were not to eat the fat or the blood. That belonged to the Lord. <clears throat> when Jesus suffered for sin, he was thoroughly spent unto God. His great agony and suffering was due to a separation. This, uh, we're talking about sanctification, separations involved in all of this. It was due to a separation that took place within himself. His sinless soul, his sinless body, his eternal spirit seemed to be at war with one another as all our iniquities were laid on him. He knew no sin, yet he became sin. He trusted in God, but God turned from him. He is the prince of life, yet he was laying down his life. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. He loved, yet received no love. He was good, merciful, compassionate, yet he was hated, despised, mocked, and rejected. There was no satisfaction, no peace, nor agreement within himself, no refuge in which to hide or to be comforted. The very best of him, the richest parts of him were laid out like the innards of that bullock in sacrifice on the altar of God. He was entirely consumed without the gate apart from both God and man. The matter of being without the gate is a necessary separation also. <clears throat> there are two main items of interest here. That is, of course, the body and the blood. There were several sacrifices under the law which, you, which we've mentioned, but the blood from the sacrificial animals was sprinkled within the tabernacle, first on the mercy seat and then on the altar. In the bodies of the animals, those sacrificial animals were cut up. The fat portions were burned on the altar, and what remained of the body was taken outside the camp and burned there. These sin-bearing sacrifices were to be completely consumed and nothing of these was to be eaten. The rule concerning the eating of the sacrifices was stated in Leviticus 6.30, no sin offering whereof any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation to reconcile with all in the holy place. None of those shall be eaten. It shall be burnt in the fire. There was to be absolutely nothing remaining of this sacrifice. No one was to share in it. This is how atonement was made. The blood was precious, but the body was detestable because of sin. The blood was the proof of the purchase. The life is in the blood, and that part was presented to God. The blood sanctified priests and things, but the body bore the sins of the people. It was cursed, and anyone who came in contact with it was defiled. The best parts of the body were burned and sacrificed to God on the altar, but the rest of it was treated like garbage and burned without the camp of Israel. Nothing of that body could remain. It had to be completely consumed because it represented and bore sin. Sin had to be removed from the people of God. That's the point. Amen. There couldn't be anything remain of this. Likewise, Jesus also suffered without the gate in order to sanctify the people with his own blood. He became sin for us and was made a curse for us. He was completely separated, not only from the people of God, but from all humanity. From Lamentations, is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. Sin must be separated from the people, therefore all our sins were laid on him. He was oppressed and afflicted. He was cut off out of the land of the living. Atonement was made by a great separation. He was outside the gate while they were in the city. His body and blood were separated one from another. The father and the son were separated from one another. The priest and the people were separated. The sacrifice and the people were separated. He was rejected and despised both of Jew and Gentile, religious and secular. He was cut off from God and man. Jesus was the most solitary man there ever was while he was on the cross. 
Reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. And finally, Jesus' body and his spirit were separated. And all our sins were cast into the depths of the sea. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. After he had made an offering for sin, the grave could not keep him because he had no sin of his own. He was not the seed of Adam. He's the second man from heaven. His separation was only temporary, just long enough to take sins away. He's no longer without the gate and no longer cut off from God and man. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This is the sanctification of Hebrews 13, 12. This is what Christ did. Now, John saw the end of this. Now, we I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just kind of pointing out a difference here. We've been talking a lot about sanctification having to do with how we live in this world. That, that's, that's proper that we talk about that and, and remember it and do it. We, we must be sanctified, but now let's keep in mind the end of this. John wrote about the end of it. Uh -huh. Revelation 21, there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of those seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried, you are got to see yourself now. Yeah. You're going to look in the mirror. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. That's what we're headed for. That's what Jesus has sanctified us for. That means his sanctification means this is going to be done in the people of God because Jesus has sanctified the people with his blood. Now, having known these things, brother, I want to leave you with an exhortation from Hebrews 13. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. We're talking about sanctification again. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.